Good evening and thanks so much for your time with us. This is News at 10 on TV3. We're also live on 3FM 92.7. And you can be part of the conversation by just following our social media platform. We're streaming Facebook slash news on TV3 and on 3news.com. Now, let's begin the bulletin with highlights of some of the day's news stories. And beginning uh, from uh, the Winneba in the central region, the Vice Chancellor of the University of Education, Winneba, uh, former Vice Chancellor Professor Mauto Avoke, and the Finance Director, Dr. Teoflos Senyo, have been relieved of their positions at the university. This was after the Winneba High Court found them guilty of procurement and other financial malfeasance. The National Association of Graduate Teachers has given government two weeks to pay their five years outstanding salary areas and vehicle maintenance allowance. Nagrat says teachers will withdraw their services by December 31 if government does not pay the 50 million cities it owes teachers within the five-year period. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs is proposing an increase in passport application fees from 50 cities to 100 cities for ordinary passport processing. The fees have not been reviewed for the past 18 years and this, according to the Ministry, is negatively affecting its internally generated funds. Watching us from Logo in the Upper West Region, if you're watching us from Kintampo in the Bonafo Region, if you're watching us from Swedro in the Central Region, thanks so much for your time. This is News at 10. Let's start with a big one. Lands Minister John Peter Meu says he will recommend to Cabinet for ban on illegal mining to be lifted in January next year. It has been nine months since a ban was placed on small-scale mining in the country. Peter Meu indicated the lifting of the ban would depend on the level of cleanliness of the river bodies, validation of licenses, and the commitment of miners towards land reclamation. He admitted the ban has made life difficult for the people whose livelihood depends on the trade. The Land and Natural Resources Minister insisted the ban was necessary. Let's stay on this issue a bit longer. Uh, Seth Clay is a mining uh, analyst. He's just joined me in the studio. Good evening, Seth. Grateful for your time with us. So, um, lifting the ban next month, is it the right thing to do? Well, I, I think that uh, a good evening to your, uh, your viewers. I think that uh, the ban in the first place has achieved what it had to achieve. And I think lifting it at this time it is the right thing to do. Is government not succumbing to pressure from these uh, uh, small-scale miners to lift the ban? Well, you see, uh, the small-scale miners are legally doing what they are, right. uh, uh, have been mandated under the law to do. Mm. The problem was with the galamseers which uh, was a purely leg illegal activity. Right. So basically asking the uh, small-scale miners to go back to work 
will be a very, very huge, uh, uh, what do we call it, uh, impact. Uh, have a, a very huge impact uh, uh, on the economy. I was asking the legal uh, small-scale miners to go to work or the, uh, the legalized small-scale mining. Yes, the legalized ones. The legalized ones. One. The legalized ones should go back. Okay. Now, so if that is the case, why then did we decide to lump them together with those who were doing illegal work and ban all of them? Well, uh, I think that the, the extent of uh, devastation that this country was, was facing from that activity, whether legal or illegal, mm. was, was getting out of hand. And I think that the action to put a freeze on mining and to look at the whole sector again uh, and to put in certain safeguards was, was a move in the right direction. So you can say that to, today, in the middle of the month of December, that devastation has been, has been dealt with and the miners can go back to work? It, it has not been dealt with comprehensively. I think there's still a lot of work to do, uh, but keeping the legal ones out of their jobs was also hurting the economy. Let's not forget that most of these people uh, have contracted loans which they are paying interest on. So literally, you know, w w the government was putting them under pressure without allowing them to go back to do their work, which they have legal permits for. The, the minister said that he's going to recommend to cabinet to, to, to lift the ban. It, the, the legalized ones are going to start work. The problem is the safeguard to prevent the legal ones who do a lot of illegal things and cause devastation to the environment, how to control them. Can he, in two weeks, be able to put in that safeguard to ensure that when the legal ones are allowed to start working, the legal ones do not take advantage and cause more devastation? I, I, I am going to, I'm going to make a recommendation. I've said it before, but mm. I, I think that allowing the legal ones to go in itself will create that safeguard. I see. Because if, if they are working hand in hand with government, they can fish out most of those ones that are doing it illegally. But their complete absence might even give those illegal ones, you know, some cover to be doing it underground. But once they are there and they know that when the illegal ones are doing it, they run the risk of being asked to stop once again. So they will become, uh, uh, they will police the system themselves, so to speak. I so I believe that allowing them to go back is a right thing to do. One, because of the economic impact it will have. Mm. Because uh, uh, for, for this year, I believe that, you know, 30% plus of production from the small sea sector has been lost to the economy. And this translates into billions of dollars. That is the situation we have. So the problem, though it started with an environmental issue, mm. is a socioeconomic issue. And the impact on our economy is, 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 is huge. I, 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 I believe that the World Bank and other institutions that are really uh, uh, interested in, in our economic uh, uh, development will be asking questions. You know? And I'm sure that maybe some of, the, uh, of these behind the scenes uh, uh, what do you call it? Might the have, consultations might have, might have uh, now, crystallized but, but, into but this. But if uh, we can't control the impact, the dangerous impact, of uh, these small scale mining. Uh, does it matter if uh, we make the money and the environment is destroyed? But I come back for you to answer that question. Now, let's quickly listen to uh, Mr. Kenneth Asibe. Now, the Chief Executive Officer of the Ghana Chamber of Telecommunications, Kenneth Asibe, has indicated the Chamber will help fight galamsey with technology as well as provide training for journalists in the area of telecommunications. Let's listen to him. Galamse with you, that one, we can't leave it. I'm sure now what we'll try and do is to see how can we use technology from the chamber's point of view, get, my, get our members to be able to deploy technology all in the fight. But really, really, really it's important. And uh, another thing that we want to be able to do is, and, and I think Lloyd mentioned that in terms of the things that they're doing currently, uh, in terms of training, you know, and most of the time we take it for granted. Ghana is not a car. You know, even you in Accra, you suffer the deficit of training. And so 
they have started moving out. And you're talking about even in uh, the whole telecommunication area, you know, ability. You know, we're not producing a lot of specialists, but we hope that, you know, we'll be able to get into that space, you know, where we get. So we want to be able to sit here today and not assuming that we know all, you know all the things that you need, but to be able to get from you to tell us what are some of the gaps that you see that are available so that if we want to start some training, we can, we can uh, uh, deal with that from a point of knowledge. He led the fight and he's still leading the fight against uh, illegal mining. Uh, Mr. Clay now was asking that we might have lost some uh, uh, finances to Galamsey uh, because of uh, the ban. What the economy would have benefited did not come in. Now, if we are unable to control proper mining, government had a plan. If we're unable to control it, does it matter if we make money and yet the very environment we're making the money to live on is destroyed? You see, uh, you know, when, when, when this uh, issue came up, I was one of the people who uh, spoke out and said, well, this thing must stop. But again, uh, the world has advanced. And you go to uh, South America, countries like Chile, like Brazil, have, have gone through those problems. And they have solutions. So, so you know, uh, we need to go there and learn how they have been able to control this mm. from, 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 from putting uh, pickers on the ground until rehabilitation and cropping uh, 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 the land to revegetate it. We, we, don't, we cannot reinvent the wheel. You know, the solutions are out there. So, and we need resources to develop this country. And these natural resources are God-given. All right. I'm grateful for your time with us. Seth Clay is a mining uh, consultant. Uh, talking to me about the possible lifting of a ban on small-scale mining. The Lands and the Natural Resources Minister uh, giving the hint fair. We're looking up to that. There's more on this on 3news.com. Let's take a break. When we come back, we'll have more. Welcome back to News at 10. The Railway Development Minister, Joe Gatti, has indicated rehabilitation works on both the Western and Eastern rail lines at various levels of completion, adding that both will be ready for use by the first quarter 2018. He was speaking on the sidelines of a dialogue with GHIGL investment consultant who are Ghanaian UK experts in the rail sector. People want to see the track. I agree with them. But a lot of work goes on before the track <laughs> happens. I mean, you prepare the work. 80% of the work is preparation. The permanent way is 20%. The permanent way is the track lane. And that is at the end of the day. And so they do all the preparatory work before they come and lay the track. So I'm saying that part of what we are going to tell the investors is that they need to close by 2020 October. We're not going to have a situation where people are building in December and uh, 2021. We have a four-year term. Um, God willing, we'll get another one. But we are just looking at the first four years. And by 2020, uh, by 2020 October, our documents will show that you have to close. So one of the things we'll be looking at for potential investors, those who have the capacity to build within that time, those who have the capacity to raise money. And so you have to show proof of money. You have to show the technical competence. And don't forget that there's technology today that can do two kilometers a day of lane of track. In fact, there's some technology that can, that can even do four kilometers. And so it can be done within the time frame. Now, on, that's the eastern line. On the western line, we are doing major rehabilitation. Don't let, don't let me not forget also that we are going to you see rehabilitation on the eastern line come January. Hopefully by March, we would have restarted the Sawum, the Sawum uh, passenger service on the narrow gauge. But on the western line, we are doing the final engineering design. We've also rehabilitated uh, the narrow gauge up to Takwa. Um, the, the train arrived in Takwa on November 27th this year. It was just the head, the locomotive, it was a trial run. Because we want to make sure that it's very safe. It's a passenger service. So what is happening is that the owners, engineers, that are team engineer for Italy are now going to make sure, uh, they're going to make sure that the track is a safe track. That track, some of the track already carries freight. 
I'm afraid, I mean, I don't want a freight train to derail, but if manganese derails, I mean, it's not as bad as a passenger train derails. So hopefully that service, that passenger service and light cargo service from uh, Takwa Foodstuffs and so on will also start in the first quarter of next year. My guide in the studio for us to take a look at the uh, Ghana's railway sector to my immediate left is the Chief Executive Officer of GHIGL Investments Consultant, Ademo Mohamed. Good evening, sir. Grateful for your <coughs> time. And then to my extreme uh, left is the Railway System Director of GHIGL Investment Consultant, David Otto. Good evening, sir. Good evening. And grateful you, for your time, too. So le let's start from here. Uh, Mr. Ademo, you have been here for some time. What do you make of Ghana's railway sector by way of its uh, ability to function as a transport system? Um, from what I can see mm. and also from my engagement with the ministry, I think they are making very good progress in terms of the ability to bring the right people to come and support them in putting the railway um, industry into good shape. Because currently what we have is not, uh, if I would put it, it's not good enough and it needs to be rehabilitated and I think that's why the, mi the ministry and as Honourable Minister has just uh, indicated that they need to rehabilitate all these uh, existing lines to, as part of the overall master plan to get the railway industry back into good shape. Mm. So from what I, from my own perspective, for my engagement for the past uh, five, six months, I think the ministry have made... Uh, Some progress. Yes, great progress, mm. considering... To what bring back the real sector. The real sector yeah. Grateful. Uh, David, so uh, let's talk about GHIGL. What is it that you're bringing on board in reviving Ghana's real sector? Um, GHIGL, um, we are a couple of professionals in our in our disciplines we we have a lot of resources to cover all the areas of the railway we are a very flexible dynamic team we have a lot of experience abroad i mean in in crude terms uh, we have over 200 years of experience in the railway industry in several areas and i think it's about time we bring some back home which mm. is why we're coming back to try and assist the ministry to make sure that we get value for money i think the key question here is value for money right so you've been in for some time yeah. and you have seen our system and your job is to come in and assist. You solve the system. Is this a system that can be assisted to, to, to wake up once again? Do you know what? Yeah, you, very, very good point. So I would say the answer is yes. The master plan is superb. I gave an analogy not quite long ago. Uh, we did a project in the UK and um, the requirements or the, the client requirement was just run 10 car trains. We've come to Ghana and there's a master plan with a clear vision from the ministry of what they need to do in phases, priority phase, phase two, and the overall picture. Hmm. It's very clear and I think we can, it can be delivered. It's a it very clear vision. Yeah. Hmm. With a clear vision, it can be delivered. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Demon, coming back to you again, I mean, you talk about the real sector and it's about money, huge sums of money there. And how do we go around it, looking at the, the, the Ghanaian economy? Yes, I think uh, the, um, one of the things that we tend to forget is there is something called non-fair growth of revenue. And I don't think it's one thing that has been really considered. Advertising on the railway can generate a huge sums of money. Um, I think London Underground generated almost 1.1 million pounds just on non-fair through advertising. So you can even use staircases for advertising. So there's a lot that we can do and also I think investors are beginning to understand that the next phase of railway is Africa. So and that needs to be promoted. And if the promotion is good, which is what the ministry are doing, I think uh, we can definitely bring money uh, the, uh, because we can't depend on government mm. to fund all these projects. Right. So we have to look right. at various means to fund and we can use commer commercialization of some of the assets that belongs to the railway um, industry. Mm. 
to bring in more money. Advertising is very, very key. And that's one area you rely on. And, and you said that the, the, the investors are looking at Africa for, when it comes to the real sector. So it suggests that they are ready to come in once uh, the, 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 the systems are good for them. Yeah, and exactly as my colleague said, mm. is the vision. There's a clear vision. And the master plan gives a clear vision. And I think the ministry have really done a great job mm. by, bring, by putting that master plan uh, together because it, it gives a clear vision. And I think we are here because we can see the vision, we can see the opportunities, and we are passionate to come and support with all our expertise mm. for them to meet that vision. Uh, David, you, you spoke about faces. Uh, how, for instance, the, the viewers watching us, what should he or she expect? What, what kind of real system are, are we looking at? I mean, we have seen the ones in the UK, the US. I mean, ours here is, is not something we can talk about. What, yeah. what, what should we keep our eyes on? Um, you're right. So phases, the minister spoke about phases. Mm. So phase one, rehabilitation of the existing. We have a narrow gauge that is 119 years old. Believe it or not, the first radio line in Ghana was built in 1898. Mm. So it's 119 years old. So it cannot be done overnight. So there's rehabilitation to keep some routes, critical routes to run. Then there are some new, what they call standard gauge, which is done in most countries in the world. From Takwa to Kojokrum, for example, on the Western Line, it's being looked at as well. Work will start next year. So that's what I mean by phases. Mm. You cannot do all in one head. So we're done in phases. So in three years, according to what the minister said, a lot of work will be complete, will be completed in accordance with the, with the, with the um, master plan. Mm. But it's got to be in phases. So you do some rehabilitation work, you do some new works. And I think it, railway as a system is very interesting. So I'll give you an example. If you want to build a new railway line, the track carries the train, right? right. But the track sits on something. Mm. It can be a bridge, it can be formation. So you need to make sure that what it sits on can actually take the weight of a train. Now, believe it or not, yeah, I, I was doing some, uh, some numbers in my head. Um, a typical train weighs about 40 tons. Now, the weight of a car, like a Jeep, weighs 2.2 tons. Yeah? So you're talking about almost 19 times right. the weight. Mm. That's what runs on four wheels on the rail. So that's a lot of weight put on the formation, which you have to design to make sure it carries the weight or it collapses. Because it's derailment, like what the minister said. So you do it in phases. Mm. I see. We're and the work that. has started already, so yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll hope to see that. Let me give the, uh, Mr. Demo the last words as we leave the studio. Uh, finally, your, a few words for, for us to wrap up. Okay, so uh, we are here to support the vision that mm. the Ministry of Railway right. have set up. And we, we are bringing on board, as my colleague just said, over 200 years of railway experience. Mm. And we are bringing the right resources. We want to support, we want to assist the ministry to put the right structures, governance, policies, and also regulation in place to ensure that we have a good, safe, reliable, operatable railway. I'm grateful. Mr. Adamu Mohammed is the chief executive officer of GH, GHIGL, investment consultant. Uh, and then uh, David Otowo is a railway system director. GHIGL Investments Consultant. Again, we're grateful for your time with us. And uh, we'll follow this up. There's more of this on 3news.com. Uh, that's how we're wrapping up the show. Thanks so much for your time. Have a good night. <laughs>